Hey y'all, good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Tech Backstage. This is episode, live episode, three of four this week before we go into the holidays and the final week of the year. And today I am joined by Ru Mitra, the founder and CEO of Omdina. Ru, how you doing? I'm good. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for also inviting me for the hour. On this podcast. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, I'm excited to have you on the podcast. Um, I'm not a uh, AI engineer. I you know I started my career as a uh, as a front end engineer and then you know moved a little bit more into full stack and, and cloud after that. But uh, it's something that I've I've really started to dive into uh, over the last year or two. And um, so I would say I'm probably like a hobbyist AI developer right now. Uh, but I'm trying to get good at it, um, failing more times than not. But uh, it, it is an area that you know that interests me a lot, and I think um, I think it's an area that you know the the further we go, even into the century, the more relevant it's going to become, right? And I think right now that there there's just there's so much unknown around it, right? There's so many people that don't really understand how AI works, and there's there's a lot of people that um, you know, are even scared of AI. And so um, when Carlos, our producer, uh, you know, reached out and said that you were interested in coming on the show and I checked out Omdina and saw what you guys were doing, I thought it'd be a great conversation to, uh, you know, to just dive in and, and hopefully try and pull back the curtain a little bit on on AI and, you know, how it works and, and whatnot. But before we dive into that, uh, and sorry for talking so much, um, I'd love to hear a little bit about you and your origin story and uh, just hear how you came to uh, you know, found and be the CEO of Omdina. Yeah, thanks a lot, um, Eddie. Yeah, so my background is basically coming also from a engineering research background. So I started working in AI way back in 2005, six. I published research papers and then kind of I was working in a startup. So that has been my background also. I come from a very technical background. And then there was a phase I did my master's in, in Cambridge, in University of Cambridge, and then I built a few startups. Uh, some of them failed, some of them succeeded. So that's still 2017, actually. Um, then there was a phase of my life where I felt that uh, making money is not something that really interests me. And I was kind of a bit disappointed with the overall startup ecosystem, that how the focus is all around raising money making a lot of profits. So I kind of got uh, disconnected from that world. So I, I had a couple of years off. Uh, luckily, I was invited to be a, a mentor of, of Google, and I was uh, also invited to speak in different conferences around the world. So 2017, 18, and partially 19, I spent a lot of time traveling around the world, speaking in different conferences, meeting people. And what I observed that the world has fundamentally changed in two different ways. The one is that there is, there is a, a access to knowledge became very democratized. So you, you can be anywhere in the world and you would have the same level of, of knowledge or access to the knowledge as someone in Stanford or MIT or Cambridge might have. And that created a, a lot of people out there, super smart, super motivated, uh, who are willing to do great things. But access to the, all this access to knowledge became very... Uh, uh, it became very ubiquitous. The opportunities are still restricted to certain groups of people living in certain parts of the world. So I was then realized that I was driven by first say, can I create something where I give opportunities to people from all over the world to come together and build something together? So that was my first motivation. The second motivation was about overall about AI. And as I come from an AI background, and I saw that there is uh, most of the AI solutions that are being built are not for social good. And only a fraction of the work that is being done is in the AI for so social good, which we call AI for good. But most of that work is also actually not in the real world application. They are mostly people coming, talking, creating some proof of concept, but that's where it ends. So I was driven by the second part is, can I create a platform where we actually only build AI solutions that has a social impact or social or environmental right. overall that we call as in the space called AI for yeah. good. 
so these are the two things that motivated me to to start there with. there is a lot to unpack there i think that's probably one of the most um at least for me, that's one of the most impactful opening statements that we've had from a guest on, on the show. There, there's a lot there, especially um, I was reading a really interesting, actually a blog article. Um, the um, somebody at slight, the, the, you know, the, the product company, they have a blog and they talk about this stuff. And I was reading about how, uh, you know, this, how, how SAS is dead or not dead, but it's broken because there's this, there's this kind of, I want to say that this in the, in the tech industry there, you know, there's this over productivity that we're all striving for, for, right. And there's this, just like you're talking about in the, in the, in the startup ecosystem, it's about, you know, trying to find product market fit and then scale as fast as possible and then exit. Right. And so it's about trying to raise money to get out the door and to market it and then blow it up and then just sell it off to somebody else. Right. And I was actually having that same sort of, on my, when I got back from my morning run this morning, I was having that same kind of like inner dialogue with myself reading that, reading that blog post. Cause I was like, I, I feel that a lot. You know what I mean? There's a lot of times I get app fatigue and there's times when sometimes you're in, you know, I don't want to alienate the entire industry, but there are times when you feel like kind of overwhelmed by the requirement to have so much output and so much productivity and to, you know, always be results driven, like, Hey, how much, what's your monthly recurring revenue and how many active users do you have per month? And, uh, and I was actually kind of thinking that, about that a little bit today is, you know, how do we actually have an impact globally, not even with tech necessarily, but, you know, just in general, how do we, how do we get back a little bit more to center? So, um, Anyways, I thought that was a really impactful statement that you talked about right there. And then also, um, you know, talking about how the majority of AI programs aren't actually out there for social good, which is, I think, a place we could actually really use AI, right? Um, so anyways, I thought yeah. that was... that. Yeah, just to yeah, add to that thought of the startup part, and I'm happy to come back to the AI for good part too is I wrote an article like six months, few months ago on why VC backed startups are not good for the world and why do we need to build a community first startups? And on there, I purely build a community first startup. We haven't raised money from VCs and we don't want to raise money because exactly the reason you said that the whole model of VC is scale, scale, scale uh, and yep. sell it off. Now, during the process of scaling, you're creating an artificial growth. You're just, which often is not good for the world. You know, do we, e-commerce websites giving all these heavy discounts so that some people go and start buying something. Most of the things people don't even need those mm -hmm. to buy, but they're just buying it because they're giving some discounts. That kind of thing is not what we need in the world. Yeah. So, so this whole model is, I think, broken. And, and we need an alternative model, which Omdena is based on. It's a community mm -hmm. first. Where it's, it's, it's first focused on benefiting the community. Yeah. What is good for the community? Community is people, the, the, the world, people who are stakeholders. And that naturally then falls into AI for good. Why are we only talking about AI for good? Because once we give the focus for the community, the people, then by default, the right design, we'll not build something that is not good for, 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 the, for yeah. the people. So that, that's the, the model that we've tried to follow. And we, we really believe in that, that kind of money. I, I do really love that. I, uh, I, I agree with you on, on, you know, the, the current model is, you know, it's kind of like the overconsumption of goods, right? It's anyways, we could have a whole other conversation on that and maybe we will in a future episode, but I, I don't want to get too sidetracked from the AI conversation. Cause I think a lot of what you're talking about right now even plays into what we were just talking about with how the, the startup, uh, the VC back startup scene is 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 complicated and, and tricky. But I guess one of the first questions that I have for you, just you know, around the topic itself, is you know, you said the majority of AI right now isn't even being used for social good. Like, what do you see it being used for the majority of the time? Like, I mean, I can I can think of some examples, but I'd love to hear from you about you know how you how you see it being utilized right now. I mean, most of the solutions is basically business process auto, uh, optimizations. So how can we optimize processes? Whether you can always, maybe some of those cases, you can say trickle down somewhere and say, okay, this has to be good. But it's not 
the main purpose of the building the solution. The main purpose is to optimize the processes, tools, uh, not to benefit the people, but to benefit the mm -hmm. business so that they can save more money. So, so that's what I do. You, do you see one of the things that I was just thinking about too, as I was prepping for this, and actually one of the things that probably like disturbs me a little bit is the use of AI in applications as well for engagement or continued use or, you know, for dopamine fixes, you know, some of the, the examples I can think of, for example, is like Netflix, you know, the, uh, you know, the sit around and watch an entire series for eight hours in a day, like didn't really exist before Netflix. Right. And it's, using these AI models to over optimize the user experience so that, you know, the user's really getting what they want. And I mean, I'm guilty of it too. I've, I've been binge watched an entire show, but then there's also the examples of like, you know, talking about what happened with Cambridge Analytica or with, you know, Google over optimizing your search results to give you what they think you want, as opposed to, maybe giving you a little bit more neutral, uh, you know, and like non-biased information, not based on what your past search history is, right? So I think there's a lot of use cases out there where AI is being used, like you said, not just for business productivity, but also for these other things that it's so new, we don't even necessarily have quantifiable data on what the long-term impact is going to be, right? Yeah, I mean, one simple example, you gave the example of Netflix, I can talk about social media, Facebook, for example, yeah. or, or Twitter, our feed is based on what we have liked. Yeah. So we keep on get, getting the same feed. Now, what does that do? It's, of course, because the companies are optimized to improve the engagement, engagement is more like, so I'm getting more likes and share. But what it does is that I am reinforcing my biases, we all are biased. Yeah. So we we are reinforcing them. Now, what it that does is that it divides more, uh, more, divides us more because all I see is all the people that all the feed that I see is basically what agrees with me. So I'm like, wow, everyone agrees with me. Now suddenly, yeah. <laughs> I see one other feed which is completely this, and I'm like, oh, this guy is somewhere is completely like racist or something because like, yeah. I'm out of the world. Yeah. But because I I just live in my old bubble, so what is what the social media is doing because of the opti optimization of our feeds, creating our own little world. And we all create our own little one more and more and not having access to another side of the, the story. And it, it divides us even more. So yeah. this simple example is showing that how the society is getting more and more divided, and which you can see in today's world, our society is so divided. And the moment, yeah. the worst is that in the past, if I get another opinion, I will not react so strong. They're like, okay, oh, that's another opinion. In today's world, the moment you see another opinion, people are like, oh, I, this person must be a racist, must be something, must be the, like, that's not normal. That's not possible that someone not agrees with me. Right. Yeah. I actually, um, that's a really good example because I, I'm not really uh, a Facebook user anymore. But one thing that I do still use uh, is Instagram. And so like my feed is turned into basically F1 uh, images, like because I like F1 racing and uh, cat memes because my wife loves cats and I send her the cat memes. So now anytime I go on Instagram, it's either race cars or cat memes. Um, so, um, like it's something that I've experienced firsthand. Um, but I guess one question, like following up on that, cause I do want to talk a little bit more about the topic in depth is like, so what does that mean for ethics? Is, is it ethical for these companies to be, to be doing these types of things? You know, I guess what even is ethical AI and, you know, how, how do we use AI, you know, in like you're talking about to affect the world in a positive way. That's a lot to unpack. Sorry, you can probably answer just one of those questions. So um, it is true that it's very difficult to define what is ethics and I can, whether this is an ethics or not. Well, at the end of the day, a company, for example, is, if driven by profits, then that's okay because that's what they're they are driven by. So they are just trying to optimize their bottom line, the KPIs and the KPIs is optimize engagement because that's good for the business they don't care about whether the engagement leads to more division in the world or not now you know we can from their point of view or from a company's point of view they can say oh, that's ethical because we are just optimizing what we have been but from a user point of view or from from my point of view i think that's not ethical because 
you know, it's end up creating more division in the society and in the world. Right. So we all can divide in a way. Now, what is ethical AI? Look, and there are so many examples. I can go on and give an example after example where Amazon and Microsoft build something that is not considered ethical. And even they later on saying, okay, that's not ethical. The reason is this, that the, the, the key to building ethical AI is understanding what makes an AI unethical. And the, the, the thing that the, the, the AI itself is not unethical. It's not like the algorithm is ethical or not. The right. key is the data that is being trained on has biases, basically, mm -hmm. right? Look, yeah. And as long as you're training your algorithm with a biased data, it will end up being let's say, unethical because it will be unbiased. Now, why is it a biased data? Because humans have biases. So yep. if a machine is trained just on your data, let's say like you said, Instagram, well, that will be a biased uh, uh, because that's just using your biases, your biases of liking some uh, F1 and, and cat, let's say, right? Now, that is very important to understand. And the way to build an ethically, I, I say that is an algorithm that tries to take into account multiple views and people, not just relying on a group of people and their biased opinion to train the model. Mm -hmm. Right? And that's where it comes on Dana because we, when we build a company, it's a platform for people from all over the world, from diverse background, age group, location, to come together, collaborate, and build those models. So these models that we build are not like one engineer necessarily sitting somewhere and building. It's actually through a collaborative effort that these are built. So a group yeah. of people from say, 30 countries, 20 countries, from all different backgrounds coming together. And then the chance of identifying the biases in the data and de-biasing that or taking into account different opinions and training the model through different perspectives of the data is much higher. And yeah. I think that's the way to build a more ethical AI solution. I, I got a follow up to that actually, but I, you know, I think one thing that, that really surprised me, you know, as somebody who didn't start with data and, and AI model, like data models, uh, and, and like training models was, was really how simple training AI is, right? Like there's a lot of people out there that I think like, I kind of conjure up the image of the movie Ex Machina, if you've ever seen it, where it's like, it's the sentient robot and it's just like sucking in as much information as it can. But like, I remember even like when I fir wrote, first wrote my like, like my first linear regression, just how easy it was because you're just looking at, you know, your, your input variables and what you're trying to predict as an output variable. Right. And I mean, I know that's a really dumbed down way of looking at it and there's way more complex modeling out there, but it, it was, it was kind of surprisingly simple to me. And, um, to your point too is is when we're doing these models if you buy you know if you take my initial data set my, my initial you know uh input and then you feed that into the ai model and it you know goes oh this is what eddie likes and then you go back and feed me what you think i like and then then i start doing it again then you feed it back to the model what you end up in is a feedback loop because you're not actually trying to take in any sort of outside um you know, correction, right? Like, like maybe what you like or, you know, what somebody else likes. Right. So, um, you get in this feedback loop where, you know, all of a sudden you start with maybe one thing that's a little bit more tailored to you, but then pretty soon everything's just a hundred percent tailored to you. Right. Um, which is a long way of me kind of asking, uh, and going back to talking about, you know, how we use ethical AIs in, in companies, but do you think there's a way for companies to look at AI a little bit more holistically, right? In the sense is like, and we can use the Netflix and the Facebooks and the Instagrams as an example, but is there a way that a company like that can use AI, but in a way that, you know, like we're talking about for good, where it can still be used productively, but without, without those biases and without potentially having those negative effects and those negative side effects? Well, I mean, you, of course there is, and there are multiple ways to do with that. So one is one way is through legislation, right? So the European Union is coming up with new legislation where they said that the social media companies are, I presume for every company, mostly social media, that they have to make the algorithms kind of open source. They have to tell to people 
why am I looking at getting this that particular feed? So, this, so, so that when I get a feed, I, I should know what, what makes me get that feed. So it's in a way for true legislation, make it force the social media companies to kind of make it transparent algorithms that they are using so that other people can see that, oh, look, or identify the bias. Okay, look, you are using a bias algorithm so that they are forced to make it kind of unbiased. So let's say that's one way. The other way argument that I kind of often argue is that it's, as I said, through collaboration. When you are making these algorithms, get people who are from diverse backgrounds so that you are not, your algorithm is not driven by the bias of opinion of one person and how should the output of the algorithm should work as. So if you make the designers of the algorithms who are writing this more diverse, then the chances of making such algorithms which are biased is much less. I'll give you a simple example. Yeah, sorry. Oh, no, go, yeah, keep going. I, I just wanted to piggyback on that, but go, yeah, finish. I, I will just give a very simple example, and it's happened with Amazon. This is an example I often say. So Amazon wrote a recruitment AI software to hire engineers, and, and they spent a lot of money to do that. And what happened that when they launched that thing, it showed that that algorithm was biased to hire men over women. For exactly wow. the same CV, it was just hiring men. Why so? Because it was trained on a data, because hiring in general, technical hiring is unfortunately biased. So it was trained on the data that was already biased. Simple as that, right? The, the interesting thing is that why did the people who were building that algorithm, who were actually building the system, did not I know that the data that they're training the model on is biased? I mean, they should have already started right from the beginning that, okay, we know that the bias exists in the hiring process, so we shouldn't train the machine only on the data from the hiring. But they didn't do that. And I suspect that because the people who were writing the algorithms never experienced the bias themselves. So they were unaware that the data could be biased. Had they got a, perhaps a female or maybe someone who had experienced the bias during hiring, if they had that person in the team, who were writing the algorithm or building the system, that person would have immediately told, look, we need to de-bias the data. Right. So this is why, the, that's why I say that it's very important to get a group of people from different backgrounds. Now, and I want to stress this point of diversity because, you know, people often say, oh, it should be diverse men, women, gender, um, I don't know, sexual orientation, but I'm not talking about that diversity because I always say that if a group of people, men, women, different gender or kind of sexual orientation, all from the Silicon Valley or all from San Francisco are not diverse to me. Diversity is people from different backgrounds who are coming in. Maybe, you know, for me, a, a room with five white male, but coming from five continents is more diverse. Right. Then, you know, so, so that's important. That people get people from different backgrounds and make them, then they can work together, collaborate, and they will chances of building a more ethical solution. The, I, I guess the, the, the follow-up question I had to that was though, if, if the people building the AI can't identify the biases initially, how do you identify those? Are you able to, you know, audit those, those, you know, data sets, or, I mean, do you need to bring in kind of like a neutral third party, but how do you identify, or is it just, you have to go back and look at it after the fact, but I mean, you know, how do we make sure that AIs aren't, aren't biased and, and how do we put it into a, you know, a repetitive process where we can continue to audit these things? In the case of the Amazon and also it happened somehow in, in other cases where the people who were using is identity found that bias easily, right? So they were just kind of had that, uh, they were, they provided two CVs, exactly the same CV, but a different gender and, and the machine preferred all the time male. So the people were doing that. So of course, the standard process should be that after the, the, the model had been built, there should be a, a, a validation set, which is kind of someone should be able to build that validation set that validates that the machine has, is not biased so that it doesn't kind of fix, prefers one over another with some, because of some biases. So there, there is a standard process that after, even after, if not during the building the model, if it's after end of the model, then there should be a, uh, um, a validation uh, process. Uh, but if not, then you go and launch it and then people find it out. So in the case of Amazon, it was after they launched it, 
that people found that out. Interesting. Um, I'd love to dive down that rabbit hole a bit more uh, in the interest of having about five or six minutes left here. I, I do want to talk a little bit more about um, also how this affects the future, right? Because I think as, you know, I, I think every year AI becomes more and more implemented and, and ingrained in the things that we do, right? So, um, and I think it's probably scary to hear, you know, if there's, you know, AI bots out there for recruiting that are basically filtering women out. I mean, that's a scary thing to hear, especially if you're a woman, right? Uh, and I, I think it's, I think it's, a little bit worrying for a lot of people that, you know, they're, they're concerned that, you know, a, you know, they don't really understand all the inner workings of how AI works, but also if you're hearing things like that, where you're like, Hey, this, you know, I might get phased out by this, this, you know, AI algorithm, like, you know, what does the future hold for somebody like me, especially like you, you were talking about automation backstage, right? So love to hear a little bit of your thoughts on where we headed with AI in the future. Do you, do you see, you know, ethical AI and, and, you know, like you, like we were talking about like AI for good, just kind of inherently built into everything. Do we still have a lot of work to do to make sure that we get to that point? Uh, what, what's the future hold for us? Well, I mean, I, I don't know what the future holds for us. <laughs> Sorry, I can predict, loaded question. I can, yeah, I can at least what I say that uh, my, what I'm doing is trying to build the future that I would like to to see, right? So that's uh, what I, I cannot say what will be the future, but but I think that we, I hope that we, we do take into these things into very seriously. We we do take into building uh, AI models that are compassionate and conscious. In fact, I I had a, you know, I run my own podcast, I had a podcast with uh, David Hansen, who is the creator of Sophia Robot, and we spoke about it, and we are working on this, how, why it is so important to build compassion and consciousness in AI. So why do we want the algorithms to be uh, not just kind of a piece of black boxes that they are input out of data? So, I, and I, I think there's a lot of people who perhaps see things that way. And, and I think that I'm very uh, optimistic that uh, we can build this kind of solution because people are seeing that. People are seeing that, uh, that there is a danger if we do not take into account this uh, uh, algorithms which which are could be potentially biased and that can lead to more divisions in the society and and a, a whole lot of different things yeah so yeah I, yeah i definitely think especially with the political climate in the united states during the last election uh i think it's easy to see how there could be you know very real uh negative effects from this type of stuff um also want to just kind of chat really quick uh and again i'll try not to load this question up uh on you but AI and automation, I, I think there's a lot of talk about this right now and how it's going to affect, you know, not just U.S. jobs, but global jobs, right? Uh, you know, we've seen Tesla put the the, the Gigafactory in, in Texas and a lot of its robots putting the, putting the cars together. And, you know, a lot of manufacturing is headed that way. Maybe not all of it, but um, d and I, I think we all know that technology changes the 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 job landscape, right? Like we, we can't, you know, there's jobs that existed, you know, hundred, 200 years ago that no longer exist. Right. So there is somewhat of a natural evolution in the job market, just kind of based on, you know, innovation and, and whatnot. But do you see that AI, like, how do you see AI affecting the job market in the future? Do you, do you feel like it's going to remove a lot of jobs? Do you feel like it's actually going to open up the opportunity for a lot of people maybe who are displaced by automation to work, you know, in the AI field, how do you see it affecting the, the job market? Well, again, you know, I, I try to avoid forecasting the future, but, right. but I hope, again, I hope, and I think it's possible that um, what it, it, what it to help humans to, to touch up something which is more human in us. Right. So, Algorithm still now, let's say you can create a robot. You can still have a robot in the cashier counter, but you cannot still now replicate in a robot the human interaction, the smiles, the 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 conversations, you know, the empathy. That that is very difficult yet to build in robots. So I hope that people, even if they are they think that their, their jobs are being threatened, they will start to rediscover their job into being more human. 
try to like an accountant if an accountant is saying okay tomorrow a robot can come or an automation can come take away my job then try to be in more contact with your clients try to create right. these human relations so i think if you are afraid of your job then try to find the aspect in your job that that actually makes you an human that makes us an human the human interaction the connections the, the empathy if if your job does not require any of those kind of skill set and if it's a routine work you know just the kind of data entry let's say then i think it's good that that job goes away to a robot because in a way that's a waste of human time if we are just doing things that doesn't require our skills and maybe we should try to find jobs uh, which actually develops our skill as being what actually being as being a human means I, so many people hate their job then i think the reason they hate their jobs is also because it doesn't develop it doesn't help us to develop um as humans it doesn't help us to develop those human connections and the bonds right. yeah. we, so so my point is that yes jobs will go away specifically jobs which doesn't require any kind of human skills right um, but i think they should go away because if someone is sitting and doing those work it's it's just waste of of time and energy for that person yeah um, no i yeah i agree i i think in there's a lot of things that you touched on earlier too, you know, just around, um, you know, making money and, and, um, also, you know, talking a little bit about how corporations use these things to make more money. And, you know, you actually brought up the fact that, you know, one of the ways that we can, you know, bake in this, this, these ethics into AI is through legislation. Right. But we wouldn't need the legislation if the companies just wanted to be responsible about it and do it from the beginning. Right. So there's this, I mean, I'm hopeful that, you know, in the future, there's this, there's this world where we aren't doing jobs that we don't have to do to make money that we don't want to spend on things that we don't need. And that the jobs that we do have transition away from, you know, like you said, these, these things like data entry and more towards, you know, positions that have impact on the world, right. As opposed to, uh, you know, sitting at a computer and entering numbers into a spreadsheet, you know, maybe those jobs can go to the robots, but, you know, we can focus more of our time on uh, meaningful tasks because, you know, again, I think one of the other things that I hear a lot about too is, you know, like kind of this productivity, productivity fatigue um, where you always have to have some sort of output and you always have to be, you know, hitting metrics and KPIs and, uh, you know, again, within the tech, tech scene, but also in, in other places because you're in other industries as well. And, you know, hopefully there's this world in, in the future where uh, we can worry a little bit less about that. And I think worry a little bit more about just being human and, you know, contributing to the world that we live in. So um, I like your, I like your, your outlook and, and your, your philosophy. So um, yeah, just to add to that, what you said, I actually write a lot and I wrote many articles and one of the articles is about that. I wrote that, this idea of productivity as input output like a machine that's not what yep. humans are in fact i'm most productive when i'm doing nothing when i'm just sitting when yep. i'm meditating it's because that's where the best ideas come so mm -hmm. we need to get away from this idea of productivity as input output constantly how do we up that's what we humans are actually so so yes uh it's very very important and I, I think that a lot of stress in the world most of the mental problem comes from this constant need to be productive, constant need to be doing something, constant need to be an output driven. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not how we should behave. And I think that my machines are good at doing that. So we should develop our human uh, abilities. Yep. Compassion, yeah. connections, empathy, these kind of things. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, well, Rue, we are way over time, but I appreciate you taking the time to stop by and talk all things AI with me. Um, before we take off, Carlos, do you want to just do the last announcement for the week and then we'll get out of here? Absolutely, Eddie. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> thank you, Rue, for having joined us today. And I have a, one more quick announcement for, for tomorrow right here on Tech Backstage. We are going to be having the last uh, interview of the year, and that is going to be, excuse me, with uh, Mark Schwaber, the 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 president of uh, Mo Monarch. That's uh, Monarch. the name of the company, Monarch. Monarch. Uh, and the topic is going to be from Tesla to tractor. Which is the, he's going to talk about the the future, the immediate future of agriculture and te technology in agriculture, both hard and soft. So the hardware and the software part. So 
that's what we're going to have right here on Tech Backstage tomorrow. Join us at 12 noon Pacific time and be here or be square and happy holidays, every one of you. Thank you. Thanks, Carlos. Thank